doctors, I'm warning you now, they may hear things you don't want them to hear. All right? <coughs> what? <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. You ready to go? Okay. Okay, we're going. All right. My name is Rick Smith, and um, usually I start off by giving a couple of announcements about other things that are related to my lecture, only because they're important later on. Uh, one thing I want to bring to your attention, which relates to this lecture in a big way, is uh, a friend of mine by the name of George Haas has written a new book. It came out uh, towards the end of 2005. It's called the Sidonia Codex. It's in the syllabus which is why a lot of things I'll mention are already listed in the syllabus. If it's not, I'll tell you. Um, and uh, it's extremely important that you read a book like that because it deals with the direct connection between the, what's referred to as the geoglyphs on Mars and the geoglyphs and cultural icons of Mesoamerica, that being South America, Mayan, Incan, and Aztec, and Olmec. The connection being that what he refers to as Olmecs he identified with me as what I was referring to as the Moorish legacy, okay? Uh, the Sidonia Codex is a big key to understanding the relationship between Mars and Earth. Um, both he and I had agreed that one of the biggest reasons that NASA keeps burying this stuff, um, that there's hundreds of geoglyphs out there. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of Richard Hoagland, but what he had done was would be seen as juvenile compared to what George Haas and William Saunders have done with the Sidonia Codex. It's 10 years worth of research. And uh, it goes far, far above or beyond what now would be just juvenile shenanigans with what's referred to as the face on Mars. Um, the stuff they get into relates to the people of color and hue here on Earth, the Mesoamerican cultures of South America, who of course came from the Olmecs of Africa. And he and I were talking, and one of those geoglyphs is the image of a primate with negroid-like features and the headdress of an Egyptian. And there's no way in hell that white NASA is going to let that get out to the general mainstream public because you'd be admitting too much, okay? Um, that just gives you a real, you know, just a glimpse at what we're going to get into. Um, about myself, I was just talking to uh, someone over here, but... Uh, Let's go over a few things. Um, the way the, uh, we'll do the lecture here is that uh, I'll give a, uh, a brief introduction to myself, um, overview of experiences, what brought us to this understanding, mentors and inspirations, um, and the missing piece. Then I'll explain how the lecture is structured. We'll get through that in a, hopefully about 15 minutes because there is a limited amount of time to this tonight and it's like kind of like five hours of information packed into two hours, all right? Um, my first awakening came at the age of 21. And in that awakening, uh, I was shown everything that had happened before from childhood on up to the age of 21 and everything that would be happening with me into the near future, okay? Uh, during that time, um, what was happening was, uh, now I can say this, I'm 36 years old, I have some basis to go from. Uh, I've looked back over time and realize that there's been a pattern every 10 years on the 11th year. And what I mean by that is that there wasn't just something that took place at the age of 21. 10 years before that, at the age of 11, there was also something else that took place. My mother and I together, viewing this from the perspective of being a generational phenomenon, my mother and I both witnessed uh, our very first bona fide um, uh, UFO experience. Then at the age of 21, I had this extraterrestrial awakening the significance of that is that at that point, the, uh, the entity that I refer to in my book as mother, and I also refer to her as the crone, uh, had came to me. And um, at that point in time, it just so happens to coincide with the fact that I was deciding to go back to school at SUNY Old Westbury to uh, refocus my efforts more so on fine art instead of commercial art. And that's where I ended up finding myself, but it, in finding myself, People don't seem to realize when I say that, there's a lot more behind that. And finding myself, it coincides with the extraterrestrial experience with the crone coming and explaining a few things to me about what had been going on, not only with me, but with my family in general. 
and this is when it was made aware to me that this not only had it, it was it wasn't just about me, although it was culminating with me, it had to do with my mother and my grandmother, and maybe even back further than that, and this is how it becomes a generational thing in my family. Um, some people have asked um, in reference to the feminine goddess energy, why would it be passed on to a man if the tradition was grandmother to mother, shouldn't have been to daughter. There were no girls in my family. Um, my whole generation of kids were all boys. But as we go along in this lecture, I think you realize why the mantle of responsibility was passed on to a white Caucasian male who has a lot more power with his voice than anybody else because of the racist mentality of the issues we're dealing with. Okay? Um, and the pattern continues. In the introduction of my book, I actually talk about the most, the most recent part of that pattern or cycle came yet another 10 years after age of 21 and 31. So you figure 11, 21, 31. At the age of 31, I was going through uh, a very difficult trial and tribulation in my life personally, okay? And it had to do with um, someone else who was also equally involved with this with me, someone I refer to in the book as Ella Mermaid. Um, there were issues going on there at a time that uh, was almost like baptism by fire, okay? And by the time the year 2001 came along, she had to go her way, I had to go mine. There were two different things taking place there, and we couldn't stay together anymore. Um, that brought about a different kind of an awakening, and it's around this it's it's, uh, it's around this time that I end up having another um, extraterrestrial experience, where um, an, an entity associated with the crone ends up coming to me and says, you know, grabs me by the arm and says, "What the hell are you waiting for? Get going!" Okay. Um, it's from my early 30s on in the last six years, that my focus on the paranormal, um, where I was in my 20s, you know, uh, was one thing. Where I am now in my 30s is much different. Um, in fact, what I talk about now, I never would have understood really 10 years ago. I probably would have gotten it, but never would have understood the significance. Here I am now at the age of 36, and uh, what has culminated over the last five years since the age of 31 is that I've gone in a direction that um, has a much more solid foundation to it. And what I mean by that is that the abduction phenomena by itself, Freemasonry by itself, doesn't work. And this is why you get these asshole white academics who get away with saying, oh, that doesn't exist. Well, that's funny because if I ask members who represent the other 70% of the population, that be people of color and you, also known as the sun-kissed people of Earth, uh, I seem to get a different answer, okay? So you got 70% of the planet, blacks, Hispanics, Native Americans, Asians, okay? Anyone who's seven shades darker than me, giving me one answer, and you've got this other elite 30%, Caucasian pale skin, saying something completely different, going against the grain of truth that represents the majority. So I was getting to a certain point where, um, I, I, uh, about two years ago, Peter Moon and I hooked up again. I had known Peter Moon since 1994. But around um, 2004, we, hooked up, we, we had hooked up again, and uh, he, um, he knew intuitively where I was going. As a matter of fact, he turns out to be one of my mentors. Um, he ends up uh, walking out to me at one of his meetings, hands me this giant book. It's about yay thick and square like this, okay? It's in the syllabus. I do recommend you take the time to study it. I'm about one-third of the way through it, and I'm still reading it because it's got little tiny type like this going down every page. Um, but he sends it to me, and I look at it, and it says, the biography of Noble Jewelry. He says, I know about this. He says, I've been involved in getting to know the Moorish legacy. He says, but I have not read this. He says, this is for you. And he just gives it to me. I said, well, what do you want for it? I mean, the book is about $100. Uh, 
he says, I don't want anything for it. He says, this is what you need to go the rest of the way. Um, and I said, okay. I start reading it. It's written by Elihu Pleasant Bay. And from what I understand through Peter Moon, he's recently spoken to the author, Pleasant Bay. And he definitely wants to talk to me and get in touch with me because he's never heard of a white guy getting out there and talking about this stuff. So this is like a, an enigma and an anomaly to him as well. Um, but it was bound to happen at some point, okay? So, at one point, as far as the, um, the, the, this of course helped formulate a better structure to doing these kind of lectures. And of course, um, during the time frame of my experiences with the Crone, one of the things that she had taught me, we had, you know, these were like educational paranormal experiences this is why I have a hard time associating with what's referred to customarily as the abduction phenomena. A lot of those issues, people, uh, they have a victim complex, and that wasn't me. So early on, even in my 20s, I felt like there was something different about me that didn't exactly fit. Uh, these people feel like they've been raked over hot coals. You know, I feel like I'm Superman. So there's something going on here. Um, one of the things that the crone had burned into me was that she would not always be there. Things would happen. She would have to make a major sacrifice and decide what side she was on, finally. Because, of course, she's part of this extraterrestrial council, and as with everything, there's good and bad on any council. Um, and they were looking for an excuse to label her um, as a traitor, treasonous, because she had the stench of humanity on her because she decided to side with human beings. And the crone is what you might refer to as one of the praying mantis types, an ancient healer, okay? Um, been around since, you know, time immemorial. Very ancient race. There's only a few of them left. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, very tall, about, you know, nine feet over me, okay? Um, but one of the things she says is, since I will not always be here for you, she says, you will come across others, mentors of your own kind. And she says, you will listen to them, men and women. And she says, they will teach you the things you need to know to fill in the gaps so that you can go the rest of the way. That was the other major realization that came in the early 30s was that a lot of these, these mentors and teachers, you know, a lot of them were whites, but they were getting information from people who were all of color and hue. And that was another realization, too. It's like, where were they getting the information from? Okay. With that in mind, I can, I can tell you why the lecture is structured the way it is, what it says on the syllabus, history, health, and wealth. Okay. The reason I have labeled it, called it that, is because those are the three, that's the holy trinity of a true democracy, which, of course, we do not have, which is why I'm talking about it. And you can envision it as three major volumes on the shelf of a library, history, health, and wealth, okay? Um, in which case, you would need bookends to hold up those volumes. And in this case, the bookends I'm referring to would be linguistics and economics, okay? I had one person asked me um, about the, at the end of uh, September of last year, I was up in Yonkers. Someone asked me, uh, can you tell us, about, you know, what's the deal with the, um, the reptilian issue? I said, if you want to understand that thing, okay, that whole issue with uh, abduction phenomena and reptilian contact, you must first learn about real estate investing. I said, there is nothing that you can learn in a vacuum. I said, the only way to truly understand what's going on with the abduction phenomena is to understand economics. And the only way to learn about economics is to learn about real estate investing because that is the backbone of the economic structure on this planet, global real estate investing. Okay? Investing in tradable commodities. There are two concepts I want you to keep in mind through everything I talk about. Flesh and bone, the investment in humanity, versus wood and stone, the investment in the tradable commodities and the real estate that humanity lives on. Okay? And this is the two feuding interests. When some others would say, you know, benevolent factions versus malevolent factions. This, of course, leads to the title of the book, Legions of Light, Armies of Darkness, Flesh and Bone versus Wood and Stone, okay? Um, 
So this is, you know, history, health, and wealth. Um, the, the way the lecture is done, and granted, if I get through the history section, I'll consider it a success. Uh, there's stuff from the health and wealth part of the lecture that I'll just intersperse throughout as background info. Um, we may not get to that part of it. Like I said, it, there's a lot to talk about just as the history plot. And even though I call it history, health, and wealth, the real vision you should have in your mind is that the history is used as the foundation and the health and wealth issues are then built on top of that, okay? So we don't necessarily have to get to those things, although they are key components to understanding history in a repetitive pattern-like cycle, as the old phrase goes, you know, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it over and over. Mark Twain said some kind of variation like that. Um, let's see. The two aspects of the lecture to keep in mind is one of my mentors, his name is Phil Sparks, he deals a lot with the hollow earth stuff. He heard me talking one day, he says, come here, he says, you have, much the same way that Peter Moon did, uh, he says, come here, I have to show you something you need to know about this. He ends up exposing me to the Robert Morning Sky cosmology. And when I start talking about it, it's going to sound like I'm talking about the Zachariah Sitchin cosmology, okay? The big difference is Robert Morning Sky, who of course is a Native American from the Hopi tribe, Southwest America, his makes a hell of a lot more sense, and it's coming from a person of color and hue. And the reason his makes more sense is because it approaches the issue from the perspective of a C corporation, real estate investing, tradable commodities, and the structure of economics therein, okay? In other words, feudalism. Whereas, even though I love Zachariah Sitchin, the problem is he comes at it from the perspective of uh, um, a Judeo-Christian perspective. You can't approach the damn thing like that because it'll be skewed off in the wrong direction, okay? I have no respect for Christianity to begin with. It's useless. It's a white man's religion. It was never meant for people of color and hue. I feel bad for black Christians because they're in for a sad awakening, all right? <coughs> in fact, get the hell out now because... Uh, <coughs> Because when I'm done decimating Christianity, you're going to be running back to Egypt and Islam for solace, okay? <coughs> anyway, um, Robert Morning Sky Cosmology and the Temple of Solomon History, Noble Drew Ali, all right? Uh, before I dump it, let me just make sure. Mm. Okay, and uh, as an extension of the lecture, um, in 2005, when I was down in New Jersey talking at the Earth Mysteries Conference with Pat Marcatilio, there was this, uh, this little old lady sitting in the front row, and she was feverishly trying to keep up because I was rattling off stuff left and right. And at the end of the lecture, she, she, she walked up to me and politely asked me, she says, next time you do this, she says, could you put together something and hand it out? And of course, at that time, it gave me the idea, okay, I can't be everywhere at once, but I can hand out something that can go everywhere at once. And that's when the creation of the syllabus came into existence. The syllabus is not for shits and giggles, it's for you, okay? I don't just do it for my health, the damn thing is 15 pages long. It takes time to staple that shit together, okay? Um, so that's for you guys. It's free. People look at me like I'm nuts. Why don't you charge money for it? I sell the book for 12 bucks, who cares? So the syllabus is extremely important because it represents my footprints in the sand Wherever I leave off, whatever we don't get to cover, and whenever I'm not there, you've got that to go with. So you can follow in my footsteps. It's me on paper, okay? So that you don't need me. After this, okay, you can go your own way, all right? Um, so that's the point of it. And the syllabus is always evolving and growing over time. The syllabus is always available in its updated newest format from the website, ufoteacher.com. There's a direct PDF link right on the main splash page. You can always go there and get it or recommend it to someone else. If you don't have a copy on hand, just say, oh, go there. Go to the website, download the PDF, print it out yourself. Voila. Um, and that's how you can spread it around the world as well without me, okay? Because I won't be here forever either. But the syllabus will, okay? Um, so from that, we get into 
the very essence and the conceptual understanding of the lecture. Uh, when I had my first awakening at the age of 21, um, and then later on it followed through at the age of 31, what was happening along the way was this manufactured, fabricated thing called the ego was being shattered in me. By the time I reached the age of 31, it was completely shattered, destroyed, split down the middle. Um, what I'm about to say is going to sound like I'm talking about Freudian psychoanalysis, but I'm not endorsing that. I just need a place to begin to explain it to you guys, that's all. Uh, when it got split, of course, what did it split into? The superego and the id, okay? What that really means is that um, from id, ego, and superego, you get self, soul, and spirit, okay? That's the metaphysical equivalent, all right? Um, the next level you would go to of significance would be understanding the self, of course, is the flesh, the soul, and then the spirit. What this relates to in Gnosticism and numerology is the idea of the numbers 666, 777, and 888, okay? Now, one of the biggest misunderstandings throughout history is that uh, you get these nut jobs, once again, white Christians, who say, oh, 666, the work of the devil. And there's a reason why they say that is because Christianity is a pulpit of propaganda for Freemasonry, white Freemasons, all right? So they don't want you waking up to anything. And I'm telling you, what I am telling you is forbidden. This is why my head is wanted on a silver platter, because I'm not supposed to be talking to you about this stuff. But the thing is, 666 is the beast. But the question was, and the question that nobody ever bothered to ask was, who the hell is the beast? OK? The beast is the man, you, me, the next door neighbor. That is the beast. And the beast is the slave, henceforth the consumer slave. Another concept, like I said before, flesh and bone versus wood and stone, another concept to keep in the back of your mind. There are two kinds of people in the world. And you need to decide what side of the playing field you're on. And those two kinds of people are consumer slave or master investor. All right, this relates to the symbolism here. I use the term master investor. It comes straight out of the real estate arena and economics, but it can be used as a metaphor for anything. You could be a master investor at anything. Spirituality, economics, history, you know, religion, ufology. You know, it doesn't matter what you want to relate it to. The point is that the number 666 is man, that's the beast, the consumer slave. 777 in between represents transcendence, the trials of life. That path that you go on to stop thinking like a consumer slave and move into the mentality of a master investor. Which of course leads you to 888, infinity, godhood, this is what the number 8 represents, infinity in the first place, it is the symbol for infinity. Um, also known as Jumachu or Jumachi, it is a state of completion, and that's why I use the term master investor, because once you get out of the rut of thinking like a consumer slave or being in the rat race, you start thinking like a master investor, you get on the fast track, and that fast track could be anything. Could be money, could be uh, knowledge, okay? Could be traveling, could be visionary, philosopher, okay? Someone like me going on the warpath. Um, from that level of understanding, you get into the area of philosophy and free association, which would be exploration, utilization, and revelation. And this is third circular thought, because every time you get to the level of revelation, you're back to more questions again, and you're re-exploring. This is also known as the power of creation for artists and gods, okay? From exploration and utilization and revelation, you get into, now of course, the symbolism of the lecture itself, history, health, and wealth. All right. Now, there's always going to be um, adversarial linchpins to understanding why this understanding, uh, understanding why these symbolisms exist at all, in this layered understanding. Those linchpins, the things that you would have to knock down like a domino effect in order to get to the truth. For history, <clears throat> it would be Reptosyrian fascism. And I'll explain that term: extraterrestrial intervention and Freemasonry. For health and wellness, it would be an invasion of the body, mind, and spirit, which is also known as the Temple of Solomon, okay? 
And this, of course, leads right to the abduction phenomena, which is a rape and molestation of the Temple of Solomon, your body, polluting the body, pharmaceutical multinationals, poisoning the gene pool and the bloodstream of the family of man, people of color and hue, okay? Keeping the beast asleep. Remember, we're all brainwashed with the idea that the beast is some exterior entity or prince of darkness, okay? The beast is within the self, and that's the thing you need to conquer, because that'll always be your worst enemy, the reflection you see in the mirror. Um, from the, uh, in, in terms of health and wellness, body, mind, and spirit, abduction phenomena, the cancer industry. When I talk about the health issues, the ultimate linchpin is to topple and destroy the cancer industry. I don't care what disease you have. It could be anything from AIDS to Alzheimer's, diabetes, arthritis, it, it, Hodgkin's disease, I don't care, Ebola. The first and most important thing to kill off is the cancer industry. Because once you crack that baby wide open, everything else falls into place, okay? This is the biggest money-making, multi-billion dollar gambit, okay? And there are a very effective, healthy, alternative ways of permanently destroying cancer in your own body without hacking off limbs and ripping out lungs and turning the body into a chunk of meat that isn't even worth keeping alive anyway. At that point, you might as well just put a gun to your head and pull the trigger. As far as wealth and money, the linchpins, of course, now, uh, you know, real estate investing, which is a good thing. I'm not painting it as a bad thing, but it's where all the power and knowledge is, okay? And then we get into, you know, the bad stuff. Economic slavery, internal revenue service, which is the ultimate linchpin there, the domino effect, just like the cancer industry. Remember, the IRS is an external corporate entity hired by the United States government. So you're being controlled by an external corporation, which, of course, goes with the flow of Reptosyrian fascism and Freemasonry anyway. Um, okay. The rest of it is broken down into the sections of the lecture itself, history, health, and wealth, plus other additional sections towards the back, linguistics, the dating game. I've started that section to put in key dates that you guys should remember. I put words in the linguistic section to remind you of the things we'll be talking about today so that you don't forget, okay? And these areas are always being updated, all right? Now, what I want to start off with is um, I'm going to write things on the board on two sides. I'm going to try and do it that way. And we'll be talking about terminology, where words come from, words we take advantage of, uh, take for granted every day, angel, demon, shadow, God, you know, stuff like that, um, where they actually come from. And you'd be surprised to realize that uh, most of the words that you take for granted every day in that particular sense all came from an extraterrestrial source, an extraterrestrial dialect, okay? Um, <clears throat> but aside from that, what I'll do is kind of like split things into two on either side of the board. This side will be symbolisms relating to the Moorish legacy. This side will be symbolisms relating to the Masonic agenda, okay? Um, in fact, I will do that right now. <coughs> Moorish legacy. And Masonic agenda. I have to tell you guys, I'm in my glory tonight. I actually have a board to draw on Masonic. <laughs> I never get that. I have to always wing these things from the hip, and uh, hope I, hope I <coughs> hope I get it right. Which is another reason why I have the syllabus, because it serves as a traveling chalkboard. Okay. Um, so how did all this stuff start? Well. In terms of um, the cosmology of it all and how it got to the point, the, the concept being flesh and bone versus wood and stone, or in terms of the Moorish legacy, the, the lamp of illumination versus the iron hand of oppression. Okay, 
Lamp of illumination versus iron hands of oppression. Flesh and bone, wood and stone. Okay? Some time ago, which is an understatement, um, you guys will realize I'm horrible with dates. Do not ask me to date something. You'll have to figure that out yourself. I like chronology, but I do not like dating because our dating system sucks anyway. And when we try to date things, this is when we get into screaming matches because someone's dating system wasn't correct in the first place. So how the hell can you place dates on some? I use, I can use a vagary of like half a million years ago to 76 billion years ago. But you know, who can relate to that? And if you can't relate to it, then why the hell bother asking, okay? Um, I'm lucky if I can remember 10 years ago, all right? Uh, but the situation was this. Um, there was a kingdom, um, a kingdom called the Arians, okay? And um, the kings, spelled like this, Arians, okay? Arian, singular. The kings, wanted to expand the empire, okay? Now you're gonna use, I have to, in terms of linguistics right off the bat, okay? I'm gonna tell you two terms that come from this. Can you guys see one already? Arian. Arian, okay. That one will go down here. Arian, as in Arian super race. And you're gonna notice that there's always, with these bastards, there's always a favoritism towards the pale skin, okay? All right? Arian. And up here, Orion. This is where the term Orion comes from. I had to bring that up now because I'm going to use the phrase Orion Empire, and you needed to know that I'm really talking about the Arian Empire, okay? This is where scientists get the word Orion, constellation, which doesn't come from science. It comes from Native Americans and Native Africans, okay? All right? Just look into uh, the Dogon tribe, all right? So, Science does not get this stuff by itself. It goes to people of color and hue and then claims it as its own, all right? The Orion Empire, which is already big enough, wanted to expand its borders some more. So they start pushing outward, and the kings are happy with uh, how far it goes, okay? And after a, you know, and, 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 um, after a while, um, they're pretty happy with what they've done, okay? And, but the thing was, along the way, um, they started teaching it to the women, the queens, okay? Now, the queens, um, you gotta remember, you know, we're talking about the female side of the species, in, in any case, um, the queens got a taste for this, okay? And it turned out they really liked doing this, this whole expanding the empire, running the operation type thing. And they realized they could do it even better than the kings because the kings got, you know, they figured, oh, we have enough, who cares? The queens got hungry and wanted to go further and further, okay? Um, this is interesting in terms of, once again, the corporate structure. Keep it in the back of your mind. You'll notice in corporate America, there's this one white chairman CEO at the top, and the people looking through the glass ceiling are a whole bunch of female VPs surrounding him. And the reason he surrounds himself with female VPs is because the women will work twice as hard as the male VPs to accomplish what the head honcho white CEO wants. And they'll keep looking through the glass ceiling because he keeps promising them things that'll never come true. This is repeated over and over again in the Masonic structure of lodges where you have the white Freemason and the female Masons thinking they're equal. If you go to any country club, how is it split up? The men go upstairs, the women go downstairs, okay? That country club split, I know this for a fact because I was a waiter at one of these ritzy country clubs on the North Shore of Long Island. I saw this for myself. This was during the 90s. I'm like, you know, this, this is, you know, we're approaching the 21st century and these country clubs are still segregated like this because it comes, the country club mentality is the Masonic mentality, all right? Um, this is why all the country clubs are all Christian, in some cases, Jewish, okay? Christian and Jewish country clubs, all right? You don't see any black country clubs like that or Native American country clubs. In fact, if it was Native American, the women would be on top because they're held in high regard and they're the ones that make all the rules and the decisions. So it's only 
in white America that you see this ass backwards function where women are forcibly subjugated onto their knees. All right. Um, so in any case, the women got a taste for this and they decided to take over the operation. The kings were like, all right, go ahead, do it. They were happy with what they had. They didn't care. So the queens take over. Now these, I was an elite group of queens who really got into this and they were called the um, Sitar Queens. Now, can you see what's going to come out of that already? Okay, think about it. There's two things that come out of this. Being that they were such wretched bastards to begin with, you've got an ancient, ancient reference that comes out in the Jewish Torah called Satan, okay? All right. And of course, Nazi Germany had a very close affinity with the Anunnaki who served these guys. So from here, you get the Schutzstaffel, SS. All right? So um, keep in mind, when I, the things I've learned over the last 16 years or so makes it very difficult for me to look at the Nazi party in black and white anymore. There are a lot of fantastic, awesome things they were trying to do, but absolute power corrupts absolutely, and it went the wrong way. It was done that way and sabotaged on purpose, all right? To their credit, the Nazis hated the Masons with a vengeance and wanted to hunt them all down. You don't do that to upper management, okay? Masons are upper management, okay? The Masons are upper management. The Nazis were, trying, were middle management trying to become the new upper management. And upper management said, fuck that, okay? <laughs> all right? So that's what happened to the Third Reich. Upper management stepped on them, all right? Uh, and once you understand it from that, it becomes very hard to just say, oh, well, the Nazis were all bad when there was this other hypocritical bullshit going on in the background, all right? We see that history, just jumping ahead a little bit, history repeating itself again. We're so busy pointing fingers at Nazis and saying, oh, they're all bad. Well, they're the ones that gave us our space program. If there were no Nazis, there'd be no 1969 going to the moon, okay? Um, on top of that, because we've refused to learn from history the right way, that Nazi party and all the bullshit that went with it has now come back in the form of neocons here. George Bush pulled the same shit that Hitler tried to pull, and in bombing the World Trade Center, they bombed upper management. Upper management once again said, fuck that, okay? and stepped on Bush, stepped on his administration. You notice all of his kingpins have been taken away from him. And now he's backed into a corner like a lame duck president. Okay? And <laughs> it really wasn't his, you know, he's too, you know. <laughs> but, you know, this is what happens. You know, we were so busy pointing fingers at imaginary bad guys, we seem to forget the fact that the bad guys are here. Okay? Power moves across the planet like a vortex. Okay? Case in point, what is New York City will eventually become Hong Kong, China, okay? Power moves like a vortex, and after the, you know, because the World Trade Center was the center of Western power for the Illuminati and the Western arm of power for the World Trade Organization. Going after that totally overstepped their bounds, and the neocons knew they bit off more than they could chew, okay? But that just, I throw these things in there so that you understand the full corporate structure of what's happening on the planet and how everything repeats itself in the grand scheme of things, all right? Um, so the Sata queens are going out there pushing out. Now, of course, through this expansion, they end up um, associating themselves with another empire, a younger empire, but just as vicious, hostile, and powerful. And that other younger empire was known as the, um, the, the Canis, okay? So you got the Canis Empire. The Orion Empire, the Canis Empire. Canis is what you refer to as Syrians, okay? From Canis, what does it look like? Two words. Canis, they were which you refer to today if you were to see a dog walking on two legs, bipedal canines, okay? From canis, you get canine, and you also get cannibal, okay? Now, the reason you get cannibal is not just because of the 
linguistic connection, but also because the Canis Empire had an elite group of warriors called the Ducks. Okay? So from there, you have Ducks. It was spelt like this, D-K. Because remember, vowels are just a crutch. If you're going to learn about language, you're going to realize vowels are absent from ancient history. Okay? Um, because remember, language comes from San Sanskrit first and then is translated to written tablets, papyrus, paper, okay? Um, duk, okay? They were known as, the, you're going to like this, they were known as the dukes of war. This is where Shakespeare got the phrase dogs of war. From duk, you get the term dog. They were Syrians, and this is how they can become known as the dog race. So from duk, you get the word dog. Dogs of war, dukes of war. And the cannibalism part, coming from the name, also came from their method of warfare, which was just to simply eat the enemy right on the battlefield. Okay? Now, <laughs> the, if you're going to run a corporation, you can't eat the employees. Okay? So the Ariane, the Sata queens, went to the Canis feudal lords, once again, the ultimate form of government being feudalism everywhere. This democracy will go back to feudalism, like it or not. Um, the Arians, you know, trying to run an establishment here and in a relationship with them, they were feuding with each other, and they realized it's more profitable to work together. Okay. What you see, the friction between these two is no different than the friction that was caused during the Civil War in this country. And the only reason the Civil War was brought to an end was because it was more economically feasible to bring it to an end. No one was making money off the war, so it was time to bring it to an end. Um, here, they were losing money, destroying everything in sight. You know, um, you know, laws of supply and demand. There comes to a certain point where war starts destroying the profits that you initially started the war for in the first place. Then you need to stop it. Um, so they decided it was more profitable to work together. And this is when the Ariane Empire and the Canis Empire, the Syrians, Orion, joined forces tentatively working together. It's not like they were hugging each other and kissing, okay? Um, what happens is, is that because the Sata queens were spreading so far out, this relationship here between the younger and the older empire began what is now known today as the two-party system. This is the original two-party system right here, okay? Now, in that two-party system, Somebody makes the rules, and the other one carries out the dirty work. The Sata queens made the rules, passed the laws, decreed. The Canis carried out the dirty work. They were the feudal lords, okay? Feudal lords. What's interesting is that as I go along in this lecture, you will also see me interspersing references and symbolisms from the Invisible College. Art, literature, film, okay, science fiction, in a lot of cases, these feudal lords you see depicted in Stargate SG-1 or the movie Stargate, those feudal lords, okay? Um, here, you're talking about, if you're, um, if you're looking for good depictions, the Satas, the reptilians, there's this great bounty hunter in, uh, played a very small role in Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back, Bosk, the reptilian is standing right there next to Boba Fett. That's your reptilian, okay? Here, dogs of war, Syrians. You ever see the movie The Howling? They stand on two legs. You see them stand up like that? That's your Syrian, okay? That's how scary it gets seeing these damn things. Imagine the bounty hunter and one of those werewolves, okay? Um, from these feudal lords, there was, of course, where the term comes from, feuding, um, the, Syrian, the, uh, the Syrians, being a younger empire, they also feuded amongst themselves. Why? Because they were vying for favoritism from the Sata queens. Okay? The Sata queens decided to pick one over all others, and they favored him over all others. And that one that they picked was known as Anu. Okay? The Syrian feudal lord, Anu. All right? Now, from Anu... Since Anu was favored by them, it made it much easier for, as you see with the mafia or any kind of uh, criminal organization, 
what do you do first? You want in a monopoly, you eliminate the competition. But you need backing from the crime syndicate to do that. This was the crime syndicate that backed up Anu, gave him carte blanche to go out and kill off all the other feudal lords, eliminating the competition. Uh, and what was he doing that for? Why was he favored? Okay, with the expansion of the empire came the discovery of this solar system, okay, in a much younger state of existence. And what made it so fantastic to discover was because, once again, concept, wooden stone, they discovered rich and valuable tradable resources within the kingdom. Now, when I use the term kingdom, kingdom is supposed to reference solar system, okay? When in any kind of Gnostic or religious literature, when you see the word kingdom, they're talking about solar systems, okay? And in each and every solar system, no different than real estate here on one planet, okay? Um, in each and every solar system, in keeping with the idea of feudal structure, corporate structure, there was always one planet that's going to be used as the throne of power. In this case, it's Earth. Earth is the throne of power. This goes a hell of a long way to explaining why they are so interested in coming here to this backwater system, okay? And a lot of the uh, naysayers and academics are like, you know, why would they come here if we're such a bunch of ignoramuses and we're only interested in tribal warfare? That's the best we can do at this point. I mean, we started off the 21st century with a bang, literally, by going and invading the Middle East. That doesn't really exactly speak well of alien contact. So, but um, the, the interest from that side of it is the tradable commodities within the entire solar system, not just this planet. But this planet is the throne of power, so it has to be given that due respect first. And this is where you get all the wars and the feuding over controlling this throne because legally, by feudal law, when you control the throne, you control all the other commodities within that system, within that kingdom, in this case, the other planets, the other real estate, okay? This is also what made this solar system something worth fighting over because of all the rare and rich and valuable tradable commodities that were found here. And of course, it's because of the ambition of the females that this system was found at all, okay? Um, but them being the elitist pigs that they are, they're not going to get their hands dirty by doing the work themselves. Why? Because in this two-party system, they are upper management, they are middle management. Middle management gets stuck with the job of doing the dirty work, okay? Middle management, this is why they favored him, okay? They bloated his ego and said, you're the one we want. Meanwhile, they just wanted someone, some lackey to do the work. So they sent him down. Now he's King Anu, so of course he too is not going to get his hands dirty. What does he do? He sends his vicious, sadistic pig of a son called Enlil, okay? <coughs> so from Anu, you get Enlil, Prince Enlil, King Anu, Prince Enlil, okay? Now Enlil did not want to come here. But this shows you how powerful the treaties and agreements and feudal law is between these two empires to the point where he could <clears throat> force his son to do this or else you're dead, okay? Um, when they come knocking on your door and say, you go here, you go, otherwise you get your throat slit. Enlil, under protest, came down to this system and his job was to basically... Um, you know, use, uh, mine the tradable commodities within this solar system. He didn't want to be here. He had his own form of middle management, okay? He had, based on Anu's name, he had the Anunnaki, okay? Now, what's interesting about this is that if we can split this, but linguistically, if we can split this down the middle, all right, Anunnaki, um, Anu's faithful, okay? All right? because of King Anu, all right? Well, that leaves us with the second half here. Now, I can only say this just on intuition alone. I find it quite interesting that Naki, you have the Third Reich associating themselves with this cosmology as being the rightful heirs to the throne. From Naki, you get a mispronunciation Nazi, okay? Um, can't prove it, but it's a strong intuition, something to think about, all right? 
Anunnaki, Anunnazis, all right? And they talked about the Anunnaki all the time. They were very into that stuff, all right? For better or worse, they knew all about this stuff. Um, so, Anil comes around using the Anunnaki, okay, to start digging out the rich and raw materials from the mines, coal, diamonds, gold, okay, silver, copper, nickel, all, right, all that stuff. Anunnaki, though, they're like royal guards. They are elite warriors, okay? They've been busy fighting with the reptilians. Now, all of a sudden, they're denigrated to slave labor. This pissed them off, okay? Remember, Enlil is playing the role of upper management, Anunnaki playing the role of middle management. There's always the two-party system here, okay? Always that kind of structure. You, if upper management wants to remain upper management, they got to keep middle management happy. Middle management's now ready to revolt, pissed off, like, we don't have to do this slave labor. You're making us do something that is totally out of our rank, all right? So, Enlo goes back to his father and says, I'm having a problem here. We're going to lose this system if we don't get this under control because the biggest problem here is that this needs to be kept under control so that the queens don't get pissed off. And the reason you don't want the queens getting pissed off is because you've got to keep the paycheck going to the queens because if they get mad, they come down, kill everybody, game over, okay? Like I said, it wasn't profitable to keep a war going with the reptilian empire. It was profitable to work with them, all right? And Anu already had his ego inflated by being the favorite feudal lord over all others. So, of course, he wasn't going to screw this around. He stepped on his son, and he says, get him to control. The son says, I can't do something, or we're going to be in big trouble. So this is when Anu sends his other children down there, Enlil's siblings, okay? Two others, brother and sister, sends down Prince Ia, okay? And sends down Ninhursag, Princess Ninhursag. This relationship here between brother and sister, okay? Even though they were all siblings, he was on one side of the issue. What you see happening here, is, as we go along in the discussion, is eventually you're going to realize what gives birth, the, uh, the feud between him and these two gives birth to this and this, okay? That's why I have the two split up like that. Prince Ia is brought in with his sister because the two of them worked together as master geneticists. In other words, the definition of a true god, okay? And their job was to go into the biological environment of the given planet and create the perfect obedient slave from that environment because it was realized early on that if you try bringing slaves from another system into an alien system, you have a revolt, you have a psychological snap, you have an emotional breakdown because they're in an alien environment. So you can't just import slaves from another system. It doesn't work. Slaves have to be fostered from the given indigenous environment. This is what makes them so damn valuable because you have to put effort into genetically enhancing and modifying that raw genetic material that already exists. And when I say raw genetic material, I'm talking about primate ancestors, okay? You see this same issue repeating itself with the Philadelphia experiments. These poor dumb suckers in the Navy who were thrown on that boat, why did they lose their mind? Because they were warped into an alien environment, okay? This was not respected, and the experiment went belly up, all right? But they knew about it. They understood psychology real well. There's, um, there's two other things I want you to keep in mind in terms of the Moorish legacy, okay? Eventually, we'll come to these terms, but I'll put it on here now. Guerrilla warfare. In other words, the underground. And the Masonic method of warfare, which is psychological. Uh, yeah, I can spell logical warfare, okay? This one usually overpowers because you have the iron hand of depression, but this one is a thorn in everyone's side, okay? So this is where you'll get this thing going on, the psychological warfare versus guerrilla warfare, all right? We'll get to where, how that term came into existence. So um, you've got these two, Master Genesis, brother and sister, okay? 
and they're working on creating the perfect beast. And they go through several experiments that are failures. And they're like, you know, uh, we're having a problem here. They couldn't get the beast, because the thing is, you need to create the perfect beast. And of course, this goes back to what I said before, 666-777-888, the beast versus godhood, consumer slave versus master investor. Here's where we get the beginning of the beast. And the beast was called the Adapa. Okay? Linguistically, look at what's in here. Adapa, that which mimics. From Apa, you get the word ape. Okay? Ape. Okay? As in Planet of the Apes. Um, which is also a very good piece of invisible college materials, the boatloads of symbolism in all of the Planet of the Apes movies. Um, now, what had happened was they were trying to get to this, and they were having problems. They couldn't get the, the, the damn thing to be smart enough to obey commands without being too smart to think, therefore I am. That would have pissed off Enlo because he was the one put in charge of the operation, okay? To make the Anunnaki happy, Prince Ia, Princess Ninhursag, their sole job was to give the Anunnaki and Enlil good obedient slaves so that middle management would stop revolting and the paycheck would start flowing to the queens again. So they finally, the thing is, in order to get to this point, they kept experimenting, experimenting. Prince Ia was at his wit's end. All of a sudden, Princess Ninhursag calls him over one day. He says, uh, brother, come here a minute. He's got a smile on her face figured out something at the bottom of the test tube, she finally figured out the, fi the proper genetic formula for creating the perfect adapa. So what does this really mean? You have this brother and sister relationship, male and female. It was a woman that created man, and it was a man who put his seal of approval on it, okay? This ends this, uh, this, this long, ridiculous argument, is God a man or a woman? God is both the man and the woman, represented by the yin-yang relationship, which doesn't necessarily have to do with sexual relations between men and women. It has to do with the brother and sister relationship of godhood, okay? The power to create life from the given environment, from the raw genetic material, which was the adapa. And what you have with the adapa is this overgrown ape-like thing that could stand upright. That was a key thing. Why? Because if you look at our primate cousins today, they can't stand upright because the muscles in their hind corner and in their pelvic bone won't allow them to. They can do it for maybe a couple minutes, but that's it. They don't have the muscular structure. So one of the adaptations that had to be made or modifications was to create the beast with the lower leg power to lift. They already had the upper body strength, which was tremendous, okay? This is why uh, chimpanzees are so damn volatile and you hardly see them in movies as opposed to orangutans, which are much more docile chimpanzees will kill you, okay? And that was the biggest mistake that was made here was that that primate ancestor to us on the chimpanzee was chosen, okay? So not only do you get the obedient adapa, but eventually along the way, there's that other hot-blooded essence running through that it eventually contributes to rebellion, okay? Um, so the Anunnaki start employing the slaves, the Adapas, our primate ancestors, to go to work in the mines. Siri, Val, early launch, has a dash, dot M. Oh, dot M. Could have been dots, could have been dashes. Um, could have been nothing at all, just, you know. Well, just 
Any guy? On the Rosetta Stone? I have no idea. I wouldn't be able to tell you. Okay? But an example of a word without vowels, which sounds like it has vowels, would be, uh, uh, let me see if I can do this right. Yay way. Okay? Okay. Okay, that's interesting. No, I haven't seen that myself. Okay. Um, let me get to the atom in a minute, as you'll be interested in what I have to say. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, he was just asking me about um, ancient words that are spelled without vowels, and when the vowels are removed, are they replaced with dots or periods? Um, I have seen that. I've seen them replaced with dashes or nothing at all, and the nothing at all was this example, Yahweh. Okay? Okay. Um, The reason you don't see the difference is that one stole from the other two, and the other two come from an original source. Christianity ripped off everything. That's why there's nothing original about it. It gets its God from the Greek Zeus, okay? It gets its angels from the extraterrestrials. It gets the term devil, I'll explain, from the labelism of Enki, okay? Anyway, Christianity, just forget about that. As far as Judaism and Islam, yes, they do coincide with each other because they come from the original source in Africa, which was known as Kemet. And we'll get into that. All right? Because um, I'm trying to speed through the cosmology so you have a foundation for the noble Jureli history. All right? The Moorish legacy by itself is enough to appreciate, but it doesn't have the same impact if you don't understand the extraterrestrial issue behind it. All right? Here get through that first, this gives it a more impetus over here. This by itself, nothing. All right? Um, so the Anunnaki are using the ape. Now, on the word of Enlil, being the hump that he is, the Anunnaki are working the Adapas to the bone into the ground, killing them off literally left and right. Now, Ea and Ninhursag, I've just put their blood, sweat, and tears into this creation. They have allegedly a certain amount of compassion that they develop for the creation as any artist or God would towards his piece of artwork, okay? So they start getting rather pissed off at the way their hostile, sadistic pig of a brother is driving them into the ground. So Ia decides, wait a minute, you know, I'm putting all this damn effort into this thing. Uh, I want some for myself, okay? And this is what begins the, um, <laughs> the, uh, the so-called original sin because now he's beginning to disobey feudal law because there's a feud between him and him. Why? Well, he's in charge by feudal law. He's the older prince, the older brother. He has to be in charge. He doesn't want to be, though, which produces a sadistic hostility towards the Adapa. On the other hand, he's the one that creates them. He's the master geneticist. He feels that he should be in charge and wants to take over. Okay? So you've got this magnificent Shakespearean drama developing here you know, uh, that's uh, very similar to the shenanigans you read about in Hamlet and Macbeth and so forth. Um, so he sets a plot in motion. Now, Enlil had already established no beast would be taught forbidden knowledge. This is why they had to be engineered to obey simple commands. Lift, shove, push, nothing else, okay? But smart enough to remember those robotic commands, okay? So that they didn't have to be retaught every damn time. Um, Ea says, screw that, he starts taking a certain group of them under his own wing, okay, and starts teaching them forbidden knowledge. But he's got to get the beast evolved a little more, a little more modified, because remember, they just got finished creating a beast that wasn't supposed to understand anything more than simple commands. So what he does is both he and his sister Ninhursag have a rather interesting relationship with another extraterrestrial race, okay? And that particular extraterrestrial race, um, put this over to here, is known as the Ankiels.
Okay. Now, what are the young keels? Once again, drawing upon the Invisible College, James Cameron did the best job ever of depicting the young keels in the movie The Abyss. How are they described? They're described as avionic, bird-like race of beings, highly evolved, evolved very far out of three-dimensional existence to higher rate densities, but they got bored and missed the fun in the third dimension, so part of them came back down to the third dimension. And that's a strange concept, which is why Drains Cameron did a fantastic job of de de um, depicting that concept. And of course, it was so simple, it was so magnificent, that when I saw the movie The Abyss, I was like, ah, oh, transparency, half in, half out of three-dimensional existence. Are you there? I don't know. I can touch you, but I can't see you, okay? Half in and half out of three-dimensional reality. Those beings you see are avionic, bird-like race of beings, okay? That's the Ankeels in the abyss. Let's, uh, let's break down the words. You're going to like this. First comes the root, Ankh, also spelled this way sometimes, okay? Now, let's look at that more closely. What is the shape of an Ankh? Now, some people misinterpret it as an angel, okay? It's not an angel, although the word is validated, you'll see in a minute. Avionic bird-like race of beings. What is an onk? Head of the bird, wings of a bird, tail of a bird. Okay? The onk, coming from the term onk heels, what had happened was Ia went to them and asked them for a little bit of help with the adapa to modify them a little bit more. They were missing something. And that thing they were missing was the gene for passion. Henceforth, I think, therefore I am. Without the gene for passion, you're a robot. Okay? So I'll put that over here, gene for passion. Gave them the code, the genetic code for passion. They, in turn, put it into the Adapa, and this is where this elite core starts being created. This elite core becomes known as the Iesu. Okay? What's interesting about Iesu? Yesu, Jesus, Jesus, and also suspected Yahweh eventually. Okay? Uh, from Yesu? The mispronunciation would be Jesus. From Jesus, Jesus, an even more bastardized term. And then it's also suspected that uh, somewhere along the way the syllables for Yahweh also came from this. Um, what you'll also uh, later on, uh, what you'll also know is the proper name, and I'll explain why later proper name for the one you call Jesus Christ is Guru Master Prophet Isa. Isa comes directly from this too. Okay? So we'll put that right next to it. Isa. Alright? Which is also used in Turkey. They still use the proper term to refer to that particular prophet. Um, Gene for Passion implemented in the Adapa turns them into the elite Iesu. Now what are the Iesu now known as? Okay? They are now known as the anointed one with the Gene for Passion the anointed ones, okay? They are taken into caves, secret caves, okay? I mean, he is really digging a hole for himself, all right? Um, since he had a relationship with the Ankeels, okay? And once again, Ank, Ank, Gene for Passion. Ankeels also becomes Angeels, as in Los Angeles, from angels, you get the word angel. The angel or the ankeels. This is why you get the confusion about the ankh being an angel. It's not, it's a bird. But the linguistic derivation is correct. Ankeel, this is why the term angel becomes associated with the term ankh. It's okay, but it's a slight historical error, okay, linguistically. Um, what also happened too now was that since Ia had a relationship with the Ankeels, um, he, that so-called religious device that is called the Ankh today, it wasn't a religious device, it was a technological device, similar to what you call a microphone or a universal communicator from Star Trek's point of view. He used it to communicate knowledge that much faster to the Iesu, the anointed ones to pound it, because he only had a limited amount of time with these guys before Enlil was looking at the watch, like, where the hell is everybody, okay? So to get this knowledge pumped into them faster and faster, he used 
this device called the Ankh, which is now what you guys call the Ankh, the angel or the Ankhiel, okay? And the root comes from that. Now, since he was using the Ankh, he becomes known as the Ankh in association with the Ankhiels, and this is how Prince Ia becomes known as the Ankh E. Enki. So that's where the name Enki comes from, Ankh, okay? Uh, eventually, you know, he was known as the Ankh. Eventually, the I is attached, Anki, okay? So Prince Ia is his real name. Enki is his pen name, okay? So this is how he gets to be known as this, okay? Um, so now, known as Enki, Enki, Iesu, all right? All of a sudden, all these words start relating to each other, and they start going in a circular pattern with each other. Enki takes the Iesu into caves. Now, he even, I mean, you know, what he, do, what he does here is, is um, from the perspective of these guys, ultimately abominable. You've got to keep that in mind along the way because there's a word that comes out of this later on that you'll understand why. Um, he goes, teaching them, they become the anointed ones. He's using the aunt, pumping it into their brains, into their genetics, into their cell memory, into their racial memory. This eventually will become the Temple of Solomon and the family of man, okay? Um, what, um, what he did, though, aside from using the Ankh, he also used another process to speed it up. Initially, there was the Arian technology of mind control and brainwashing. Remember what I said over there, psychological warfare? They used a particular type of crystal technology to help Anu and Enlil and Ia program the Adapa to do exactly what they were supposed to do. Bam, instant brainwashing, you know, because the mind is no different than the hard drive of your computer. It can be re re erased. Right? It runs on electricity, so it's easily erased, all right? Well, he goes and turns around and uses it the other way, okay? So he's using the reptilian, you know, I mean, if you were trying to piss off the queens, this would be the way to do it. He uses that same reptilian Arian technology to now pump information into the minds of the Iesu even faster, okay? They become the anointed ones. Enlil, still exhibiting his sadistic cam labor campaign of destroying the Adapas. Um, one day, Enki, now known as Enki, he's walking through the, the garden, which is where you get the term Garden of Eden from, um, and, you know, feeling sorry for the Adapas because now he's got two classes. He's got the EA, so he's got the Adapas. Decides to go to the Adapas themselves and help them in a different way, okay? basically signing his own death sentence. But uh, he goes into the garden, finds the adopters, and starts talking to them. You know, they know who he is. Uh, they love him. And he says, uh, you know, how's my brother treating you? And, you know, like, not too good. And uh, you don't like what you're doing. Mm -mm. He says, um, now you've got to remember, in, once the process was set in motion with the adopters, the point was, in order to reproduce the perfect slave every time, you had to set up a system of mating. This later on was repeated by the Nazis in terms of controlled genetic mating, okay? Well, in this particular case, one male Adapa was forced to mate with one male female Adapa all the time. Henceforth, perfect predictability as to what kind of slave offspring would be produced every time. It was a way of manipulating racial memory and cell memory in a slave economy, okay? And the thing is, the only way to keep that going was to have it in a controlled biosphere environment. That controlled biosphere is, of course, what you read about in the book, the um, book of Genesis, the Garden of Eden, okay? Uh, this is where you get the concept of an Adam and an Eve, okay? One, one male Adapa forced to mate with one female Adapa, okay? Uh, and all of them had to do that, and they were all tagged, all right, so they would remember who they're supposed to have sex with. And at a certain time of the month, at the ring of the bell, they'd say, come and get it, and, you know, they'd all go in there and go at it, and that would be it, all right? Well, the thing was, that was, for all the, for all the misery that there was, that was the only form of enjoyment that they had. So now, Enki walks into the garden, and he says, what if I could show you something 
that would make your life that much better. He says, you're not going to escape the slave system that you're in. I can't do anything for that. He says, but I can teach you something that will make your miserable life that much more pleasurable. He says, you know that thing you're allowed to do once a month at the ring of a bell? He says, well, here's a magnificent concept. Guess what? You can do that anytime you want, anywhere, with anyone. Okay? All right? So they're thinking about this, right? And they're looking at each other, and all of a sudden, the adopter starts smiling. Hmm. All right? Well, later on, Enlo's looking around. The Anunnaki are looking around. Nothing's getting done. Where the hell is everybody? All right? <laughs> all right? So Enlo goes into the garden looking for them, right? And of course, now Enki had told them, he said, look, I'll teach you this, but you have to promise and make damn sure that my brother does not find out about this. He says, otherwise, everybody's screwed, right? <laughs> so, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. So, but as with everything, somebody's bound to mess this up big time, okay? Someone's going to make a mistake. Well, sure enough, Someone was caught by surprise, right? Enlo's walking through the garden looking for something. He hears this noise behind the bush, right? <laughs> so looks behind the bush and sees a male adopter fully erect, getting it on with a female adopter that wasn't tagged with the same symbol, okay? At that point, the gig was up. Enlo knew it was his brother. He says, where is that son of a bitch? I'll kill him, right? And this, uh, once that went out, then he found out that not only did he do that, okay, not only did he do that, but uh, he found out that uh, he was also teaching the anointed ones forbidden knowledge, okay? So now he found out about the Iesu, okay? So now um, he goes on this um, unholy, you know, massacre, starts just killing off, because at this point now, you know, the adopters have been having sex with everyone. This produces a total screw up in the genetic structure of slavery. Okay, now you can't tell what kind of product is going to come out, uh, the end result, okay? All these female adopters are pregnant with God knows what. And um, on top of that, to make matters even worse, a select group was picked to be taught forbidden knowledge. And this forbidden knowledge was, of course, the whys and wherefores of the galactic community and where the adopter came from in the first place. Okay, you're not supposed to be teaching the slave where he came from, okay? Um, because that's where... Mary Shelley gets the idea for Frankenstein, okay? The awakening of the beast, and then the beast coming home to the creator to kill the creator, okay? Um, so he goes on a rampage, killing everyone looking for his brother. At this point, Enki's got to get out of town, all right? Real fast. So he takes off, but he also takes off with a whole bunch of the anointed ones, the Aesu. Takes off to what is now referred to as the ladies, and proceeds to continue on with the experiment with the anointed ones to produce what's referred to in ufology as the Pleiadians, okay? Another branch of something beyond homo sapient man, all right? Also related to the human race, the family of men, okay? Uh, some of the anointed ones stayed beside, some of the Iesu stayed behind to carry on the good fight uh, because they knew if the Adabas were getting slaughtered, their own brothers sisters, someone had to stay behind. So some of the anointed ones stay behind. Enki, he takes off with most of them, the lion's share of them, to the Pleiades. What happened was Enlil, now with his massive spaceship armada and whatnot, is slaughtering everyone left and right. The anointed ones, the Aesu, are like, uh, we have nothing to go up against this, and we're the only ones who know the truth. We can't afford to go up against him and get killed. So they initiate what is now what uh, what eventually becomes referred to as running for the hills. You see this in the movie Braveheart with William Wallace and the Scots. They say, "Run for the hills, let the British come. When they go back, we'll attack them from behind." Um, this, because you're dealing with primates, apes, gives birth to the term guerrilla guerrilla warfare, underground warfare, strike and hit, strike and hit. Okay, they go taken off to the mountains. To this day, now they were also these anointed ones. These Iesu are also known collectively as the Adam, okay? This is the Adam, okay? It's in the name Ad-Om, Om, as opposed to ape, which mimics 
Om refers to frequency awakening the beast, the anointed ones, awakening with the gene for passion and forbidden knowledge, okay? And there is a, a, there is a symbolic relationship between the, the word Adam, A-T-O-M, and the fact that these guys were created at the bottom of a test tube, okay? Atom, because, you know, Adam, yes. Well, there's a definite significance there as well. Um, the, uh, uh, so the, um, these, this, the Iesu, the Adam, they're still carrying on that good fight today. You don't call them Adam anymore. You don't call them Iesu. You call them by another name. Nowadays, you use the term Yeti, Sasquatch, Bigfoot. Okay? Sasquatch. Bigfoot. That's the Adam. Okay? They have carried on the good fight for today. They are living libraries, just like that of the blue whales of the sea. Okay? Uh, Yeti, Yahweh, um, Berserker, okay? Berserker is another term throughout every culture. You'll notice no matter what country you're in on the planet, every culture, every country has um, a Bigfoot, a Yeti, a Sasquatch, a Berserker, or a Werewolf. And at times, the Werewolf mythology is combined with the Sasquatch mythology with the word Berserker, okay? The, uh, both the blue whales and the Sasquatch are living libraries. What do you mean by that? I mean, they have it within themselves, their own, make up their own cell structure, all this key information of true ancient history, where the human race comes from, our relationship with extraterrestrial entities, the family of man, people of color and hue as true custodians of the land. They were locked with that nation so that that information would never get lost and the people of color and hue would be recognized as the rightful custodians of Earth. Uh, I, I only know that um, from what I had been taught by other uh, metaphysical teachers. I don't, I don't connect it to their only, the only connection I make is that both the blue whales and the Sasquatch represent Mother Earth. One for the sea, one for the land, and it was done that way on purpose so that if one or the other got wiped out or exterminated, the other stood a better chance of surviving. Yeah, this is right now that I've explained that much, I can start getting into what you're talking about, all right? Um, the revolt went on, endless slot now, of course, corporation feudalism, slave economy. The Anunnaki went to Enlil and said, look, you're killing off all the slaves that are supposed to be doing the slave labor, you gotta stop. So, of course, Enlil realizing stops. But what he does is now he realizes he's got to take drastic measures to get the slave population back under the call. This whole damn revolt going on. The Yesu running for the hills, he's trying to hunt them down. A lot of them did get killed off, a lot of them survived. He's uh, already got an ax to grind against the Adapas, okay? But he's got to stop killing them. So, just to be a spiteful bastard, he decides to go the other route with propaganda. Once again, using the Aryan, Aryan technology to reprogram everybody. And what he reprograms them is he wipes their mind. From that day forward, the term Enki or Ia is now labeled as forbidden, as in forbidden knowledge, the tree of forbidden knowledge, okay? He is labeled as forbidden to be spoken. The Adapa or the slave is never allowed to speak that name again and to burn it into their brains in a state of fear and paranoia. He says from this day forward, he will be known as Baal. Okay? Baal. Now, in, in this type of linguistics, to, when they wanted to emphasize true despicability, blah, you know, so what they did was they added another uh, syllable in front of that, dia. They called him dia Baal. So the person that created the human race was now slandered with the term dia Baal. Dia Baal becomes Diablo, Diablo becomes devil. Okay? Now, in order to have the slave believe this, he 
you have to also have something else on the other side making it look that much more evil. So what does he do? He puts him, Enlil puts himself up on a pedestal and he says, from now on, you will never utter the term Enlil. From now on, you will call me Gad. Now from the term Gad comes the term God. So the devil created you, God destroyed you. That's the message here, okay? Um, this is why this becomes so damn volatile and forbidden because everything you've learned is asked backwards. The devil was never that bad. God was never that all-loving, okay? <coughs> um, you know, I'm not making him out to be a saint. He had his own selfish methods for doing what he did. Um, but on the other hand, you know, the point is that which you call the devil and that which you call God are biological brothers tied at the hip in a feudal sibling war, okay? So why the hell are you picking one side over the other when these two assholes were trying to destroy each other in the first place, all right? Um, he's a sadistic pig, doesn't give a shit about you. And him, well, he knew he was going to start a rebellion that nobody could win, okay? But in the end of it all, he is the one that saved our asses with something he did before he left, before he got banished from this kingdom, before he was permanently labeled as Diabal, before he left with the anointed ones, he did something for the Adabas, okay? He pricked his finger and put his blood into the slave. Now from that day forward, now remember, this combined with this becomes the foundation for the Moorish legacy in terms of real estate investing, global real estate investing, the throne of power. That drop of blood put into the Adapa created the biggest damn enigma that to this day the entire galactic community is still trying to figure out how to get around it with feudal law. Because by putting royal, rep, royal Syrian blood into the beast. He then for gave the beast the right to be custodians of the throne of power, custodians of earth. It made them the rightful blood heirs of this planet and if you make them blood heirs of this planet that means they control the entire kingdom. Okay? That was the ultimate stab in the back to the system because even the Satar queens couldn't argue against that. So how do you get around it? That's when he starts his whole propaganda campaign, I am God, my brother is the devil, and starts reprogramming all the slaves, okay? Now, um, he's got that going on. With this feuding going on, there's another interesting group who was associated with all this along the way, who we haven't mentioned yet. Um, and of course, you know them already uh, as the Greys, okay? Now, what's the role that they played? Well, with this going on, and with the, in relation to the Anunnaki Syrians and the Satak Queens, they um, operated as the SS Gestapo. In fact, they were allowed to walk freely among the population, and they were known as the stone builders at the time, henceforth stone mason, all right? They are in keeping with the idea of a corporate corporeal body, they are the bean counters of the corporation. They are mathematical calculating little bastards, okay? Soulless to the core, all right? Um, they have a very close relationship with reptilian blood, even though they were working, they were sent down to keep things in order and spy for the queens to keep these guys in line. Because they knew the feud here, you know, was going to blow up sooner or later. They calculate in their mathematical and logical equations that they can run the whole corporate operation a hell of a lot better in this kingdom than these two imbeciles here fighting with each other, okay? So they wait. He's thrown out. The slaves are reprogrammed to forget him, okay? He's in charge by himself now, okay? But there's an interesting thing that happened. Ia had a son, Marduk. Not exactly the sharpest tool in the shed, okay? And it's in the name, Marduk. What is a duk? A Syrian dog of war. Mar, well, it's a reference to the god of war, okay? Marduk, all right? One of the Syrians. The Greys knew exactly how to manipulate the whole situation to their favor. They played both sides against the middle. They went to Marduk 
knowing he was a dumbass, but also the son of Prince Ea, they went to him and said, you see what they did to your father? You want to get even? We'll help you. We'll back you in the next campaign for control. Marduk's like, yeah, because what were the Greys doing? They were banking on inflating his ego because he was too dumb to think any other way. So they blew up his ego and told him, you're the one who should be in charge, and we'll back you. Marduk leads the revolt against Enlil, throws out Enlil, now takes over middle management with the Anunnaki, at which point the Greys realize that with this imbecile at the head of the game, they can easily take over. So they follow through on their plot, go after Marduk, throw him out, throw the Anunnaki out, lock down the whole damn kingdom, and from that point on, they take over the entire operation. Now, of course, with all this going on, you have to ask yourself, what saved their asses from being eliminated by them because this was a total violation of the treaties and relationships for producing a bottom line profit for the corporation. Well, the fact of the matter was they were sent by the Sitar queens, and after they took over, they went to the queen and said, look, you know, Anu's sons are a bunch of imbeciles ruining your bottom line. If we take over, we'll run everything on a dime, and you'll get your profit every time. So the Greys have been skating by on thin ice ever since then, uh, with the promise that they'll keep the paycheck going to the queens to keep everybody happy. But of course, this created animosity with Anu, who was the favored one by the Satas. As you can tell, the history of this solar system is like a soap opera on steroids, all right? <laughs> so um, you've got that going, a total lockdown on the planet. The Greys take over. Well, something interesting happens here, okay? From the Greys, they decide, why not a good thing? They decide to, and based on the two-party system that already existed, they reinvent the two-party system. Only in their case, they call it, you know, because of course now they are suddenly thrusted into the position of upper management. They wanted to recede into the background. They needed to reestablish a new two-party system to do all the work for them. So upper management, in this two-party system that's created by them, they invent the Raqqa pharaohs, okay, and the Raqqa shields, okay, and of course, as you already figured out, from Raqqa pharaoh comes the term Rockefeller, from Raqqa shields comes the term Rothschild, two-party system, okay. They invented that. Now, they were known as the Stone Masons, and since they were allowed to walk freely among the population like a Schutzstaffel, they became known as the Freemasons. Greys are the Freemasons, okay? This is why there's always this favoritism towards the pale-skinned abomination that does not belong to the family of man. Why? Uh, so they get, they get this far here, okay? Knowing that, in comes the Ankiels and the Moorish legacy. The Ankiels, who had a relationship with Ea and then her sag, saw all this crap going down. And even though they did not have a direct relationship with what was going on, they couldn't exactly step in forcibly. That wasn't their way. They realized where the gene for passion went and where the royal blood went, okay? They decided, Let's do it that way. This serves as the beginning of the concept of guerrilla warfare, operating underground, all right? From the gene for passion, from the concept of the anointed ones comes the Moorish legacy. That Moorish legacy is represented by the term Temple of Solomon. And it's in the name just like the word Adam, Solomon. You break it down to three syllables, Sol, Oman, Sal is Latin for sun, om, sound, you know, sound to light. Um, uh, so om is frequency, and on is Sanskrit for um, um, sound, sound to light. Basically, the name Solomon is a linguistic symbolism for awakening the beast, okay? Um, and of course, the Temple of Solomon is symbolically associated with gold, because gold is the perfect conductor of electricity, which brings us back to the concept of, of Frankenstein's monster being awakened, okay? By uh, using gold as a conduit, the beast is awakened. It's a symbolism. Some people argue, oh, yes, the Temple of Solomon really exists. It really is the go. Okay, whatever, but who cares? What are you going to do when you find it? They're going to put a gun to your head and pull the trigger anyway. Right. So who cares if it really exists? What matters 
is towards this legacy, towards the family of man, it must be understood that the Temple of Solomon is a powerful symbolism for keeping the body healthy and pure. Okay? From what had happened here was that you've got the family of man now inheriting the Morris legacy, inheriting the legacy of the anointed ones through the Temple of Solomon, using it as almost like a filter, a spiritual filter. The gene for passion filtered through the Temple of Solomon becomes what you guys know as the passion of the Christ. Okay? Now, the term Christ, a bastardized term, spelt with C-H, which is an Anglo-Saxon English spelling, totally wrong. The original proper spelling of it, it's, it's not even, it's not someone's last name, it's a title. It's a title for all major prophets. Every major prophet is called a Christ. It is spelled K-R-I-S-T, not C-H. K-R-I-S-T, Muhammad the Christ, Buddha the Christ, Isa, the one you call Jesus, the Christ, okay? Noble Drew Ali, the Christ. Okay, Adam, Adam the Christ. This is why you get the concept of the Christ energy coming through the bloodline of the prophets. It came from the gene for passion that was pumped into the anointed ones, okay? Now, being that that's, the greys were not stupid. They knew what was still there. They knew they couldn't, even with the Arion technology, they couldn't fully erase that gene for passion. They couldn't get to the anointed ones. They were hiding out. And even with the Adapas, they had to constantly keep them brainwashed. And God forbid they should be taught by the Iesu to wake up and realize their true legacy, their true legacy as custodians of the earth. You don't want the slave population waking up to that. Um, what had happened was, was that um, with the, uh, with the, uh, the Moorish legacy coming out of Africa, Mother Africa, all right, that's an important term because later on it's slandered and erased by the Masonic agenda and therefore called the Dark Continent. All right. What had happened was, was that um, there was a certain segment of the population in northern Africa which started becoming very warlike, losing its way with Mother Nature, losing its connection and responsibility. Remember, custodians of the land, responsibility to Mother Earth. This small, this particular population in northern Africa started acting very warlike, troublesome. They um, lost their way. They began to experiment on themselves, mutilate themselves to the point where they bled all of the color right out of their skin. No more color. They became the pale skins, what you now know as Caucasian. They became so warlike and such a big problem that the rest of the, the Moorish people got together and was like, what the hell are we going to do with these guys? You know, they just won't stop. They're going to overtake everything and destroy us. So they decided to banish them. This is where you get the concept of being banished from the Garden of Eden. Okay? They decided to banish them. And by banishing them, they had to pick a spot to stick them. Well, there's only one, con no, one continent on the planet that doesn't start with the letter A, and that's Europe. It's in the name. Your rope. Rope. You hung yourself. Okay? Europe is named after the African Queen Europa. Europe was a dead wasteland, and it was used as a transcontinental prison to dump all the assholes who were causing a problem, namely the pale skins. So what happened was they cast it out of Africa because they couldn't stay there anymore anyway. They had burned all the color out of their skin. No more melanin. You can't sit in the sun anymore. I burn like a lobster when I go to the beach. So they had to get out of there anyway for health reasons. So there were several reasons. One, they were no longer part of the family of men. Two, they were pale skin. They couldn't stay in the sun anymore. Three, they were destroying the environment, polluting it, experimenting on themselves in abominable ways, producing this, this, these uh, defective genetic offspring that you wouldn't even want to speak of. Um, a good example would be the abominations you saw in uh, Lord of the Rings trilogy, all those disgusting things that were created by Sauron, okay? Um, they dragged them across the deserts of Arabia. This is where the bitterness begins. Their pale skin being scorched by the desert. And dumped them in the cooler, less sunlight, less sunlike atmosphere of Europe. And leave them there. Perfect prison. Why? Because to the north you got snow, to the south you've got the mountain ranges, 
um, to the west, you've got the Atlantic Ocean, and to the east, lo and behold, out of nowhere comes the Great Wall of China. Uh, you have to remember, what comprised the Moorish legacy? It was known as the Amexum Empire. Now, the entire Amexum Empire went from Mongolia to South Africa, over to South America, and up through all of North America. They were known as the Asiatic nations, the Amexum Empire, the Moorish legacy, okay, the family of man. And then you've got this orphan over here called Europe that nobody wanted, okay? And of course, with the Great Wall of China, the academics tell you, oh, the wall was built to keep the barbaric hordes out, but no one ever bothers to ask who the hell the barbaric hordes were. The point is, it was built to keep them in, so they couldn't go anywhere, all right? And of course, in referencing the mountain ranges, there was one particular mountain range, you've got the Sierra, the Nevada, the Caucasus. One particular mountain range called the Caucasus that a lot of them hung around. So this is how the term Caucasian becomes associated with the pale skin. It's not even a real term, okay? It's like we're using the term Negro to describe black people. It just means black, and that's why it was picked. It has nothing to do with genealogy. Caucasian is also a dumbass term. So um, this is how those ridiculous things come about. But what had happened was that um, they were casted out. They were embarrassed. They realized once they were dumped in Europe in this barren, dead wasteland that meant nothing, to anyone in the family of man, they realized what they had done wrong. This is where you get the concept of like Adam and Eve feeling embarrassed and wanting to cover themselves, okay? Whereas before that, they ran around naked. But um, they, um, they were so embarrassed about what had happened, they went into this massive psychological denial about the whole thing and started inventing all sorts of other bullshit mythology, monkeys coming down from the tree, um, even to the idea of being born of a she-wolf, okay? This is what they were grasping at straws because they couldn't admit that they had been banished from the family of man, lost the color from their skin, and were no longer part of that family anymore. And this is the great sin they committed against themselves. This is why they were banished. Well, the idea is who created the a rebellion within the family of, who created this rebellion in the Moorish legacy? Um, much the same way as the CIA does it to every country, these scumbags, in an effort to get even with the family of man, because the family of man had the gene for passion, the passion of the Christ, they started that insurgency in North Africa, okay? And this is how they began to experiment on themselves. Now, what were the Greys trying to do? Well, for one thing, they were trying to destroy this. They had a vendetta against that because they knew it came from the Ankiles, which were associated with Ea and Ninhursag. On top of that, they were also looking for a good, obedient slave race, okay? And what better way to do that than to corner someone who's just been casted out and embarrassed for their own sin? So, the Greys, who themselves, of course, always favor the, uh, yes? Oh, okay. We're going to have to stop, huh? Okay. <laughs> well, that's it. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. The greys go to the casted out pale skins, and they say, do you want to get back on top of the food chain? Do you want to get even? Because, of course, they didn't learn their lesson, and the greys knew that by approaching them early on, they would be able to capitalize on that feeling of vendetta and viciousness. So they say to him, we'll put you on the top of everything. If you obey us from this day forward, we will give you all the technology you need to go out there and do one thing for us. Colonize the living hell out of everyone and destroy the family of man. Destroy them, destroy them, destroy them. So from that day forward, those original European pale skins sold out the rest of the human race by agreeing to it and by agreeing to it in feudal law that means all of their pale skin descendants were now obedient to that system. And this is why all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Europe shows up on the scene as a world superpower going out, destroying, colonizing, and massacring everyone in their path, okay? Doing it to Africa, doing it to the Middle East, doing it to the Western Hemisphere and the Americas. This was their agenda, their motive, their Masonic operation. They were known as the original Freemasons. By gaining the allegiance of the outcasted, casted out pale skins, 
They then handed off that mantle to the Palskins. And this is how the extraterrestrial connection of Freemasonry becomes an earthbound Freemasonry. That's where Freemasonry came from. And it was created solely for the purpose of burying the Moorish legacy. This is why when you see this crap on the History Channel and they just all they talk about is these damn white scholars and academics. Oh, Freemasonry's gone. Yeah, well, if you're asking the enemy, of course they're going to say that, okay? Try asking a dark-skinned black Native American or a black African. See what kind of an answer you get from them, okay? Uh, but we're so busy labeling these people as uh, with uh, bows and arrows and spear chucking that, you know, the so-called established community won't listen. But all the answers are there. You're just not asking the right people. You have to go to the other 70% that represents the majority of the population. So that's um, where it comes with that. The, um, so along the way, these prophets, there's no such thing as a pale skin prophet. Prophets are meant for those who are oppressed. 70% of the planet is oppressed by the other 30%. Pale skin prophet would be an abomination. Okay, there's no such thing as a pale skin prophet. The, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the sad thing that black masons will never be allowed to learn as lackeys for their white mason counterparts um, is that they'll never be allowed to become 33rd degree masons because if they did, they'd be given a $10,000 pass by the Vatican to go to the house of Omar in Jerusalem and see the perfectly preserved body of guru, master, prophet, Isa, Jesus Christ. And what they would see is a black man. So there's no such thing as a pale skin prophet. This, of course, also helps us disseminate truth from fiction in terms of apparitions and visions and crap like that. If you're looking at, you know, some extraterrestrial paranormal or supernatural apparition and you think you've seen the Virgin Mary or Jesus Christ or Joseph, the first question out of your mouth is, were they white or black? If they were white, they saw something else. They didn't see that. Okay? So any of this crap you hear about, you know, the Virgin Mother coming in, she's described in this, you know, white, porcelain, pure, Caucasian skin, no, okay? There was something there, but it wasn't that. If you read the book, um, Heavenly Lights, The Apparitions of Fatima and the UFO Phenomena, you'll see how all those so-called religious things, which were skewed towards white Christianity, belong to the realm of alien contact, definitively and scientifically, okay? But uh, I'll leave it there. I wish I could do more. <coughs> We're just going to do the collection here. Just okay. keep up until we finish the collection. All right, I'm going to keep up because it's doing until something. Finish, All right. Yeah. Um, we'll around a little something. And Chris, whatever you can, we want to give him a little transportation stuff. Okay? And then uh, he'll stop. Okay. But he'll continue now. If you guys want to ask questions, go ahead. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, if, if, if you look at the mission, uh, a lot of people have been hurt, a lot of people have been programmed, mm -hmm. people have started to do things like that. There's been a lot of messing, a lot of uh, blood coding, yes. things like that. Yes. Well, he hasn't gotten to a question yet. So. <laughs> All right. He's talking about the, the mixes of the races, mixed marriages, stuff like that. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah, the thing is this. Um, this is a decree that comes down from the galactic community. If you want to be part of the galactic community, you're going to have to get rid of the pale skin. And the way you get rid of that is start blackening yourself up a little bit, okay? Since the 1970s, interracial marriages have risen from 2% to 7% just here in America. That's a lot, okay? But you consider there's like about 300 million of us in here, including illegal aliens. 7% um, of 300 million is a lot and a great improvement. 
And it's got to go more so in that direction. That's why when I hear these people in the metaphysical and paranormal communities, oh, alien contact's going to happen in the year 2008. Excuse me, I'm still pale. It's not happening, okay? Um, the thing is, uh, uh, the benevolent factions, the pale skin is an abomination to Mother Earth, an abomination to the family of man. It wasn't supposed to exist. It's, uh, it's an insult to the benevolent factions to even waste their time contacting a population that engages in tribal warfare because of that 30% abomination that controls the natural 70% that's supposed to inherit the land. Um, so this is the thing that's going on. There, no, what I'm saying is, is that all the pale skins, all the pale skins have to be absorbed back into the family of man. All right? This pale skin has to go. Now that may take, you know, another hundred years, another five hundred years. So don't hear me this crap about alien contact being around the corner when this pale skin still exists. And if those SOBs do show up on our doorstep, it'll be a wolf in sheep's clothes and you should run for the hills because they're coming a little too early, which means they have other intentions. All right? Yes. Oh. The body has to have a soul. Mm -hmm. So what if the body truly dies? Where does the soul go? Is it created by a new group? The um yes, that's a another interesting the, the gene the um symbolically the gene for passion is the soul. I think therefore I am. That is the soul. Without that gene for passion, you are nothing. You're an empty, hollow husk obeying commands. This is the pro uh, this process is a, it's a learning process called the process of reincarnation, and this is what yes. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, let's give him a clap, please. Beautiful. Okay. We're gonna have to get him get him again. Maybe have a bigger crowd. I'll part come back two again, part guys. Three, you know? Yeah. He does all those kinds of things. I'll definitely okay. come back again. All right? Oh. Does anybody, does anybody have the other photo album? Oh, okay. She's got that. Okay. $12, yeah. And is this what you're just talking about? There's a lot of stuff that's in here that's written in, um, and it's written in poetic format, symbolism in the poetry. So I felt that in a lot of ways that was the only way to get it into a book like this. There is another book I want to write that gets into this in a more expansive way, a literal way. What you going to call it? Um, <laughs> you haven't made up your mind. I haven't made up okay. my mind yet. Okay. 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 Yeah. Do I have to pay you for these? Uh, no, those are free. Okay. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm the decent. Keep that. Oh, I'm thank you. I'm you here. Oh. Interested in nobody else to listen to you. Thank you very uh, much. When I contact you, uh, I have some specific questions. Oh, okay, sure. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. It's great to meet you. One last question. Yes. What is the benefit of prayer and meditation to what we are right now? So, uh, yes. You would like to buy your book. Oh, okay. I'll give you three ones back. The whole. Um, some people call it prayer. I call it, it's uh, more sensible to say meditation. You can call it whatever you want. And the reason for it is to um, cleanse your minds because in order to cleanse the Temple of Solomon, you have to first start with the mind. And the reason you start with the mind is because they use psychological warfare against the human race. So what do you want to access? When you meditate, you want to access something. What, what do you want to access? Something else already in you? Or, or well, you would, uh, what, what I feel you do is you end up um, accessing something you could call your higher self, which basically connects you to the other lifetimes that you lived, and you can learn lessons from that and open up like a whole living library within yourself. Mm -hmm. Learn what happened with the past, and then also see what's going to happen with the future, because the past and the future move in cycles. To know the past, you can easily predict the future. Yeah, above all of that, uh, What's in charge? I mean, where, where, where do all these guys? You started over here. Uh -huh. At this point in time, the system is still a two-party system. It was. Yeah, but what's, but what's controlling that? I mean, it just didn't come from nowhere. Ultimately, um, what I go back to is the Sata Queens, the Arians. Well, who's, in, who's above them? 
that you know, I wouldn't be able to tell you if there's something above that. You might. I haven't learned it yet. You might have to ask somebody else. Okay. But I would definitely. Uh, I would definitely um, try to take this and merge it with what Bob Yeri was talking about upstairs when he was writing those names on the board. Okay, the different levels. I would think these are the pale skin whites. Okay, they're called Arians, but he also called them um, uh, Cordax or Cor um, I forget the name he used. You can ask him again. That term he used would be right here. Can we study ancient Egypt and pull something from that? Yes, because the, the part I didn't get to was that the original religion of the planet for the Moorish legacy and the lamp of illumination, the anointed ones, the line of the prophets, it's called Kemet, and that is the original name of Egypt, Al-Kemet. Right. The capital of Egypt is al kahira known also as Cairo, and al kahira or Cairo translates into the word Mars. Henceforth, Sidonia Codex I mentioned earlier, the Martian geoglyphs, the Mesoamerican geoglyphs. Hebrew language. Mm -hmm. And the Hebrew. That's all from Kemet also? The Hebrew? It would all go back to that. you got to take into consideration um, black Jews, known as Levites. They were the ones specifically in charge of handling the Golden Ark. Mm -hmm. Nobody else can touch it. To this day, it exists. And anyone else who tries to examine it or touch it, especially a pale-skinned scientist, will be vaporized because they don't know how to handle it the right way. Only these black Levites, black Jews, referred to in slang, are the only ones who have been trained since the beginning of all this to handle that technological device the right way without destroying themselves. And they still exist today. They still exist to this day. Um, it is um, in association with that. It was one of the biggest motivations for getting into and invading Baghdad, getting to the Baghdad Museum, which is a profound museum worldwide, because they have these ancient alien artifacts, which are seen as religious symbols, but are actually technological devices. I don't think they work anymore, but it's like looking at giant capacitors and diodes, right. which was also the case of why the Ark is characterized as being laced with gold. Gold, as I said, is a perfect electrical conductor, the arc is a technological capacitor, diode, transistor, whatever. Right. Okay? You ever heard of Fred Bell? Who? Fred Bell. Fred Bell. Doesn't make a bell like that. No. Okay. No, no, I haven't. Uh, so, uh, What's your name, by the way? Noah. Noah? Noah? Oh, right. nice to uh, meet I you. I used to call, so you have an email address? Yes, I do. Um, I, take, I also um, use the... Um, Take the card that's in front of the, um, the postcards there. Right. There's the UFO teacher at AOL.com, that email address. Okay. Use that one, all right? And I'll see your copy of the other. Okay. Can I get your oh, sure, yes. Yeah, you want one? And I'd like to okay. Okay. Will this book touch on the concepts and the different things? Yes, um, but in a symbolic way. That's why I said I want to do a second book that gets into it literally, okay? Your name? Um, it's for Ryan. Okay. It's Ryan Borden. Ryan? Ryan. Ryan. R-Y-N? Ryan. Ryan. No. How you spell? R-O-N. R-O-N. Okay, Ron. You know, I was thinking, back in Europe, during the time of feudal kingdoms and all of that, the Moors were also had shields and, and different things showing that they were in rulership in the feudal kingdom. Was that a part of the civil civilizing Thank you. Thank you. process? Was that a part of what you're saying of the civilizing process, the mating with Moors, uh, uh, like in Scotland and Britain, they had, you know, they showed that there was a Moorish legacy, the shield. Uh, mm. What do you call the... Uh, I think a lot of that comes directly from the uh, legacy of the Sasquatch or the these those kind of um, anointed ones because every culture has one. This is where the Scots got the idea of running, fighting from the hills and using the guerrilla weapon. What the Scots learned is also what was taught to the Native Americans, who then passed it on to George Washington to win against the British. Okay. Yeah. My simplified question. Mm -hmm. Was all this commingling, was that meant to be part of a civilizing process? Yes. Humanizing? Yes. Uh, it was meant to create a gateway or a doorway for the pale skin to come back to, come back home, come back to the family of men. So that you wouldn't, 
Because ultimately, if people of color of you want to inherit the legacy of custodianship in this kingdom, they must rescue the pale-skinned brother and sister from annihilation because being that they're the ones in power, if they are allowed to destroy themselves in an act of genocide, they're also going to wipe out everybody else, black, white, or otherwise. So that's why the mandate comes down from the galactic community, get the damn pale skins back into the family of man, otherwise you're all dead. Because as long as that pale skin exists, so does the nuclear bomb. So in fact, <laughs> everybody's doing it. It's, it's our yeah. consciousness that's, that can help that mm -hmm. situation, our consciousness here, right. that can call for that the council right. of, you know, Enoch and the rest of the folks sitting up in there, you know, our brothers, you know, mm -hmm. to keep, keep that. Because if, if we have a nuclear explosion again, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, see, there's, a good, there's, a, oh, there's a good linguistic um, understanding of this.